Maya Angelou is a, is a, a poet, I guess, a writer, um, a phenomenal um, woman of words uh, who has been very revered in the United States for what she's had to offer, I'm sure, elsewhere. Um, she passed away, what, about a year or two ago? Yeah. Uh, at any rate, in fishing around the internet, I found this little clip from her that I think really speaks to, thank you. You know, in a moment we're gonna get a lot of words and a lot of language and a lot of theory. So <laughs> if you get lost in that, hang on to this because this is really what it's about. This is really what the whole thing is about, at least in my mind. So take this in, we'll get a few comments and then we'll go from there. I am grateful to be, have been loved and to be loved now, and to be able to love, because that liberates. Love liberates. It doesn't just hold. That's ego. Love liberates. When, uh, when my son was born, I was 17. My mother had a huge house, 14 room house. At 17, I went to her and said, I'm leaving. She asked me, you're leaving my house? And she had live-in health. I said, yes, I found a job and I've got a room with cooking privileges down the hall and the landlady will be the babysitter. She asked me, you're leaving my house? I said, yes, ma'am, and you're taking the baby? I said, yes. She said, all right, remember this. When you step over my door sill, You've been raised. You know the difference between right and wrong. Do right. Don't let anybody raise you and make you change. And remember this, you can always come home. I went home every time life slammed me down and made me call it uncle. I went home with my baby. My mother never once acted as I told you so. She said, oh, baby's home. Oh, my darling, mom's going to cook you something. Mother's going to make this for you. Love. She liberated me to life. She continued to do that. When uh, my son may have been five years old, my mother uh, would pick him up all the time and feed him. And I went to her once a month, and she would cook for me. So one day I went to her house and she'd cooked red rice, which I loved. After we finished eating, we walked down the hill and she started across the street. She said, wait a minute, baby. I was 22 years old. She said, wait a minute, baby. You know, I think you're the greatest woman I've ever met. She said, Mary McLeod Bethune, Eleanor Roosevelt, and my mother, you're in that category. Then she said, give me a kiss. I gave her a kiss and I got onto the streetcar. I can remember the way the sun fell on the slats of the wooden seats. I sat there and I thought about her. I thought, suppose she's right. She's intelligent. And she's, she says she's too mean to lie. So suppose I am going to be somebody. She released me. She freed me to say I may have something in me that would be of value, maybe not just to me. You see, that's love. And when she was in her final sickness, I went out to San Francisco. And the doctor said she had three, three weeks to live. I asked her, would you come to North Carolina? She said, yes. She had emphysema and lung cancer. I brought her to my home. She lived for a year and a half. And when she was finally, finally, in extremis, she was on oxygen and finding cancer for her life. And I remembered her liberating me. And I said, I hope I'll be able to liberate her. 
she deserved that from me. She deserved a great daughter and she got one. So in her last days, I said, now, I understand that some people need permission to go. As I understand it, you may have done what God put you here to do. You were a great worker. You must have been a great uh, lover because a lot of men, and if I'm not wrong, maybe a couple of women, risked their lives to love you. You were a piss poor mother of small children, but you were a great, great mother of young adults. And if you need permission to go, I liberate you. I went back to my house and something said, go back. I was in my pajamas. I jumped in my car and ran and the nurse said, she's just gone. You see, love liberates. It doesn't bind. Love says, I love you. I love you if you're in China. I love you if you're across town. I love you if you're in Harlem. I love you. I would like to be near you. I'd like to have your arms around me. I'd like to hear your voice in my ear. But that's not possible now. So I love you. Go. Well, part of the reason I share this is because I, I think the thread woven throughout all these three days, I hope this is the piece that you keep listening to. How well are you loving one another? Um, and, and if you can believe that you're good enough, which I believe that you are, and I think a lot of communities struggle with the sense of not being good enough. Uh, I'm not, we're not smart enough, intelligent enough, we don't have enough this and enough that. Um, just accumulated baggage full of self-doubt and self-deprecation about just not being sufficient. And, and I think the opposite. I, I, think, I think who you are is more than enough. Who, who you are is more than enough for the charism that you have and for really, I believe, for the, the crossroads that you're at and, and what's in front of you. It's more a matter of can you claim who you are and, and choose whatever is right and good for you. Uh, can you liberate one another to be who you're meant to be and let that sort of unfold rather than, it, rather than pulling it out of the, you know, some heady plan and saying, well, this is what we need to be and let's do it. So at any rate, I th if you can hold on to that theme as I present the rest of this, <coughs> I think it will help you uh, maintain an integrative hook. So here we go with the a lot of stuff. Um, you will get the handout on this, uh, but I decided, at least for this one, to not give it to you ahead of time. So you can just stay with me. Uh, so if you want to take notes, that's fine, but you'll be, get, you'll be getting these slides. Um, so for me, the theme for this whole thing is, is that love liberates. So let's look at the crisis, the so-called crisis in religious life. What, what I'd like to say about this this morning is I'm not, this is the only graph I'm going to show, the only numbers I'm going to show. We've all seen them. We've seen, we've seen them endlessly. Okay, we know there are 55,000 sisters and less than 5,000 brothers and less than 40,000 priests, and they're going to have half of that in 10 years. The half-life for most communities on average is 12 years. So, I don't know what your trends exactly will be, but, you know, ballpark it. You know, imagine where you're going to be in 12 years. Wow. That's pretty scary. Okay, but that's enough about numbers. <laughs> we can do statistics all day long. What I think uh, is underneath the numbers, because I don't really think the crossroads is about numbers. I think that raised awareness for sure and caused some things. I think it's more about these things. Communities are in crisis. Not every community, but particularly the global north, the western world, United States, Europe, I do have a, quite a bit of crisis on their hands. And the three top crises that they have, partly because of their demographics. You know what the first one is? The number one crisis across communities? Huh? But what, what, what might be the most common crises you hear across communities in the United States? For instance. Not enough money. That's the second one. Finances. Age. Age, but age is part of the demographic that's causing this. It's leadership. A crisis in leadership. There's not enough people to do leadership. Okay, you may have enough people, okay, you can have another election, uh, but the question is who's willing? 
And if you got that pool, whatever size that is, now of the willing, who's able? Of those who are able, who's electable? And you got that pool, now who can really work together? So you may still have some numbers. I think the question is, do you have the leadership that can really lead you? Look at yourselves 12 years from now. Two, how many cycles? What's your cycle in chapter? Six years, so 12 years. Two cycles out? Something to think about now, but that's the big crisis. Finances is the other crisis, of course. So many groups are really struggling financially. And the third, because of the demographics, the crisis really in personnel. Enough people to do whatever it is that's in your life to do. So let's say, imagine for a moment that this was a huge round table and there are 16 of you or something like that. Uh, so let's say you put on the table everything that's in your life as a congregation. Your financial responsibilities, your ministries, your, your man, your personnel, your staff, your, all your schools, whatever. I'll throw it all on the table and you all hold that up, okay? And let's say you're each holding about, oh, 40 pounds. It's pretty heavy. It's a lot of responsibility. Now go 12 years out. Now you're holding 80 pounds. How long do you think you can hold that? Not very long because the, the weight is getting heavier and heavier. So how do you deal with all that you have in your life with the personnel that you have? It's a crisis for a lot of communities. N next to that, connected to that, underneath that, is this whole maintenance mission squeeze. People are so busy taking care of the elderly, taking care of older buildings, taking care of ministries, taking care of your life, that it squeezes the life out of mission. And even the room, the breathing room, to think about a vision for the future, and the, let alone the energy to put into it. You'll leave here three days from now, you'll go home, and your calendars are all full. There's not no one say, oh, I, I can pitch in here. Every leadership struggles with it. You described it before a chapter. You know, you get these great words, these great rhetoric, you put it out there, and then, you know, the leadership goes back and on their table is life, and it's smothering the life out of leadership. And it's smothering the life out of the future potential of communities. Now, add to that these dynamics. They look familiar. You know, they're so familiar to so many communities. Complacency. We were talking about it on the break. People are saying, I don't, I don't want to be bothered with this. I don't know. Why are you going to another meeting? I've paid my dues. Been there, done that. Sitting on the sidelines, disengaged. They'd rather just be comfortable. Thank you very much. Well, there's a lot of that. There's a lot of that. So how do you get that to move? That's a challenge and a half. Workaholism. Gosh. I mean, it's culturally. We're just infused in it. I am what I do, and, and I want to do this till. You know, I want to die with my boots on. I'm going to stay out here. Don't call me back to community. I'm doing important things in my ministry. And, and that is the source of where we each feel sort of like we're valuable. We have something to contribute. So it does give us a sense of self-esteem and we are serving the world. But boy, it's so rampant, it's hard to get anybody to say, what about community? Individualism, consumerism, un and a bag load of unresolved conflicts. Do you have any of those as a congregation? <laughs> okay, so we're talking about crisis. We're not talking about numbers. We'll give you 50 more men. You still got this. You still got these. And underneath that, the whole question of survival, your sense of integrity, your sense of relevancy. And underneath that, what we talked about this morning, which is really the heart of the matter, what you just saw in the video. What is the soul of who you are as a congregation? What shape is that in? And how is that aligned with the world at your servants and what you're doing. So for me, the crisis has little to do with numbers. Yeah, that may be the incipient reason for this, but it's all this cascading stuff that's really underneath that that's much more important to deal with because you can get five more men, 20 more men, and you still got this kind of stuff to work with. So for me, this is not a vocation crisis. People have been praying for vocations for years and years and years. They're tunnel visioned on vocations. It's not the silver bullet. The average number of new vocations in the United States is what? You know what it is? One. The average. The average number of new members, finally professed new members, is what? Zero. 84%. Zero. So there's not like an influx of new vocations. <laughs> That's not going to be the answer. You may get them. 
Okay, and you may, and you may uh, revive that sense, and you may continue as a congregation numbers-wise. But this is not a numbers issue. This will not solve your problem. It could be part of an issue you need to address, but it's not the big picture. If it's a crisis of anything for me, it's a crisis of imagination and courage. Do you have the imagination, the willingness to go beyond what you already know, and the courage and persistence and willingness to try things, no matter if it fails, to keep trying? For me, that's the number one crisis across at least the United States. Now, that's the bad news. The big picture, if we open up the lens, is that religious life is not dying, it's transforming. I do believe that. Even when I started as a therapist in you know, the 80s, people would say, why are you working with religious communities? Aren't they dying? That was the word on the street. Um, and, you know, I thought about it for quite some time. But I really believe, you know, I really believe religious life is transforming. And this is old Marcus data, his way of looking at the cycles of religious life since Jesus. So if he's right, Sanders Snyder is right, all these people of sociologists who have studied this are right, then we're in this other era, this moment of transition as a religious life form moving into something new. And the question is, are you going to put your thumbprint on that? Are you going to be a part of that or not? You are a part of it in terms of you're in it, okay? And I think certainly Pope Francis is asking people to engage this work, that this epical change needs you, not only for the life of religious life, but for the world, for the earth. Have you read Adato Si, Laudato Si, his newest uh, book? I mean, the call for interdependence and for you to participate in, in helping the global uh, earth grow again is so important. So for me, this notion of the Paschal Mystery, which can be so theoretical, even though we say that creed all the time, it's the core of our creed. Well, okay, this is it. This, <laughs> you're in it now. So uh, can you really uh, participate in that faith journey, in a concrete lived way, through this process, what I call a journey of transformation. I think you're uniquely positioned to assist not only your own lives, but religious life as a whole, you, to be agents of transformation. You are devoted to mission, you're responding to unmet needs, you value community, you're committed to the more. Every religious community can probably say amen to that, that list. Religious life brings so much to our world. So you're a part of this epical change. Uh, can you participate as agents of transformation in it? With a living faith. I like this little quote here. Let me give it to you. You probably heard it. Edward Teller. <coughs> when you get to the end of all light, you know, and it's time to step off into the darkness of the unknown, faith is knowing that one of two things shall happen. Either you will be given something solid to stand on, or you will be taught how to fly. You ever heard that quote before? <laughs> it's a challenge. Okay, there's, well, you're uniquely positioned because of the faith life that you live. How strong is your faith? Will you jump off that cliff? I don't know. <laughs> but I think the faith dimension of this is so critical. And so is hope. There's a good quote right out the door that Ray was showing me. Here's the one I brought in. Hope is not the conviction that something will turn out well, but the certainty that something makes sense, regardless of how it turns out. Havel, I love that quote. Okay, so are you on the right path? If you feel sure that you're on the right path, you'll have hope, regardless of how things are panning out. Uh, can you hold on to that thread of hope? And can you hold on to that thread of liberating love? So faith, hope, and love are part of this big plan. They have to be. They have to be the, the core of it, the core of our creed. All right. So this, for me, all enters into what we're talking about, the grace crossroads. What does this scripture quote say to you? I'm sure you've seen it, you've pondered it a hundred times, if, thousand, if not a thousand. What does it say to you now about who you are as a congregation, what you're facing? Any comments? What do you think it's registering for you today? For me, 
you know, your congregation's a banana tree right now. <laughs> you have got to let something die in order for new life to emerge. You're going to have to do a lot of letting go for new life to emerge. What exactly that is, how hard that's going to be, what's the cost, I don't know. But I do know for every community, there's a lot of letting go that takes place uh, as they try to give birth to something new. Whether you're letting go of old patterns, old models, old ways of thinking, acting, behaving, old institutions, whatever. There's got to be a lot of this letting go for this new life to have a chance to be born. Okay, let me give you a few phrases just to really let this sink in a little bit more. What, you, uh, what got you to today won't get you to tomorrow. It won't get you to tomorrow. So congratulations, you're, you're successful, you've started a lot of schools, you've done a lot of wonderful ministries, you've created uh, quite a number of things and given life to a lot of people. But what you've done yesterday may not matter as much going forward. What got you to today won't get you to tomorrow. The, move, the world is moving too fast and religious life is somehow moving. So something's got to give. You can't rely on past history. You need new wine and new wineskins. If you put the new wine into the old wineskins, it's not going to work. New wineskins meaning maybe your, your way of thinking, your paradigm for who you are. So something needs to shift in a significant way. Second phrase, a bend in the road is not an end in the road unless you fail to make the turn. I love that, and I love that it's by Helen Keller. <laughs> Helen Keller is a woman in the United States uh, who was blind and deaf at birth um, and was, is a miracle uh, in terms of what she accomplished in her own life and how she learned and so forth. But her phrase, a bend in the road is not an end in the road unless you fail to make the turn, makes perfect sense. So if you leave here and you're driving down the street and there's a sharp turn and it's at night and it's raining, what do you have to do to make that turn? Well, you're gonna need to slow down, slow down. You're gonna need to look at the signs and not overdrive your headlights, <laughs> okay? So think about that as you think about our planning. Slow down, don't overdrive your headlights, look at the signs. A bend in the road is not an end of the road unless you fail to make the turn and too many groups are not making the turn. This is David Wexler. He is the father of the Wexler intelligence test, most widely used intelligence test. And his definition of intelligence is the ability to adapt. The ability to adapt to one's environment, to think, rationally to act purposefully and deal effectively with your environment. That's a great phrase for this handling of where you're at. It needs to be smart. You need to adapt to your environment. And if you don't adapt, uh, you will certainly die. So I'm putting it as plainly as I can. Adapt or die. Adapt or die. How many have been to Borders Books lately? <laughs> That's gone. A lot of things are gone. Even the dodo bird is gone, okay? Because the dodo bird later, later aches on the ground and that didn't work out very well for him. So companies are going by the wayside, religious communities are going by the wayside. If you don't adapt, you will die, period. So this is the normal sort of life cycle you could think of in terms of religious life. You could think of any organization, businesses or whatever. People get to these crossroads, 85% fail. What the religious sociologists are saying is 85% of religious communities through this transition will become extinct. I say that number and a lot of people say back and they say, well, we won't be one of them. Well, okay, well, maybe you won't be one of them. I don't know. But 15% will somehow get through and 5% of those will be on a low level functioning. So maybe 10% are really thriving again into a new cycle. The question to you is, will you be among the most courageous and innovative congregations to get yourself through this? Now, even the best and brightest and most resourceful fail. This is a, a cover of a magazine called Fortune Magazine in the United States. In 1955, they printed out the five most successful companies in the world. 500 most successful companies in the world, the Fortune 500. 50 years later, in 2005, they re-looked at that list. How many we were left, do you think? 50 years later. Any guesses? 10%. Yeah. 
close to it. 13. Interesting, that number comes close to the research on religious life. 13, 15% somewhere in there that will survive. That's incredible. Okay, so these are the folks, best, brightest, they got a ton of money, they got everything, okay? But only 13% survived over 50 years. The average lifespan for a company is about 40 years. It's a little less on average for religious communities. And like companies, most religious communities and companies, they barely get past the first year. But those that do, they average around 40 years. So it's true for religious life as well. The only thing that seems to last forever is these. Twinkies. Do they have these in uh, the Congo? Kenya? No? <laughs> Consider yourself lucky. <laughs> These almost died, but they were resurrected. Some guy who a millionaire bought them up and said, these need to go back on the shelf. So here they are again. They'll never die. <clears throat> so here's what happens. People get, groups, organizations get to this part of the life cycle where they're facing, okay, we're on the downturn. Now what do we do? We're at some crossroads. We're reaching a point of crisis. And they do these kinds of things, vision statements, strategic planning. They start downsizing. Okay, we don't need as many homes or whatever, and they start right-sizing. There's another way to talk about that. And they do strategic planning, and 85% fail. The failure rate on strategic planning at this point in the life cycle is 85%, according to Mitzberg, who did a meta-analysis of all the analyses that I've ever done. So that's a pretty daunting statistic to say that, okay, most groups, the vast majority of groups, when we get here, they try the traditional approaches, and it doesn't work. Because here's what most groups do. They create a new, improved version of the past. That's what you know best, okay? So let's just streamline that, get better at that, and they create a new, improved version of the past. You see all the ads on new, improved tide, new, improved this, whatever. They try harder rather than different. Every leadership team I'm with is exhausted. They are working their tails off, and so are many, many of the members. They're trying harder to keep it going instead of different, instead of different. They play it safe rather than innovate. Of course they play it safe because they're scared. You get to this point and you start getting multiple crises and the urge is to tighten in the reins. Um, but playing it safe, ironically or sadly at this point, playing it safe in the way most groups play it safe is the least safe thing to do right now. It puts you in the greatest risk of failure. It's sort of death by default if you choose that. They choose incremental little baby steps, small step change, instead of deep change. They focus on externals rather than the internal. You know, who you are at a soul level, how you are personally, interpersonally, collectively. They avoid trying to do something bad rather than really focus on and create something good. And they download the same information using the same software, meaning the same kind of thinking, okay? Same operating system, rather than looking at a different lens, a different way to approach life. And this is sort of guaranteed, death by default. And that's what 85% of groups do, those kinds of things. They fail to adapt. This, this reason for the failure to adapt is, I think, at the bottom line, the most important thing is fear. We are just scared to make a move. And it puts us in the worst kinds of positions. The meta-analysis that I talked about before by Mitzberg, who talked about 85% failure rate in strategic planning, the good news there is that we know why. We know why it fails. And if we know why, we can figure out maybe we could do something about this. Here are the biggest reasons, what I call the dirty dozen. Avoidance of conflict. How many of you address real conflict in your real communities, in your real life? How do you do that in your chapters and assemblies or here over the next few days? Failure to risk, to think outside the box and have the courage to step outside the box and try something new, different, even with the possibility or maybe even likelihood of failure. To glorify the past, the halcyon days of what you've done. The failure to partner with one another and to partner with those outside of your congregation to open your boundaries in a new way and to partner with others in a new way. The fear of ambiguity. The leadership team, Dan's been talking about this. What are we doing? What, what is this thing? 
it's nerve wracking to not know what exactly are the seven next steps to get this thing moving. Again, go back to your own personal moments in time. Did you know the next step? I didn't know the next step when I was in that therapist office. I was scared shitless. So walking into ambiguity is a frightening thing to do. Breadth over depth, meaning intimacy. How do you walk deeply with one another and not just keep doing a lot of surface things? That word intimacy, what does it mean? Do you know? What's the Latin derivation of that word? Walking into fear. At least that's what a Jesuit priest told me. But I like that definition because that's what it is. Walking into fear. Groups are frightened of getting honest, vulnerable, real with one another. Lack of focus and integration. You talked about one cycle of chapter to the next. How do you connect the dots? How do you keep it going? How do you integrate what happens here to the next step? I could go on and on. I just want to focus on these first two here. Conflict avoidance. Parker Palmer um, is an author here in the United States. Has done wonderful work. One of my favorite books is Let Your Life Speak. It's just a little baby book, but it's a wonderful book. He recently wrote a book on democracy, and ahead of that, an article on the tragic gap. And his notion of the tragic gap is that groups have a fear of people who are different, basically. The, what he calls the alien other. Do you know who that is? Dennis Rodman, our ambassador to North Korea. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Dennis Rodman. Would it be okay if he was facilitating this uh, dialogue with you? How would you feel about that? How would you feel if this guy were facilitating this group? How about if these guys were here with you facilitating this group? Would it be okay if these women were your facilitators or lived with you in your community? Well, here's a pair of co-facilitators. Am I raising anything in you? This fear of the alien other. You know there are five, still four or five countries in the world that this is punishable by death. Okay, which one's the alien other? <laughs> Recognize these two? Joan Chittister, Mother Angelica. Okay. Which one's the alien other? <laughs> don't, don't say it. <laughs> <laughs> we have a, a natural fear of people who are different than us, who think different and act different. And our difficulty with bridging those differences, reaching across the differences and staying in conversations together is a deal breaker. It just takes group, groups to their knees. So working with that is going to be a really important piece should you go in this direction. Risking getting outside the box. Risking imagining and doing something outside of the box. Okay, I tried this exercise with the group that was with last time. Let's see if you remember the answer. So take out a piece of paper and draw these nine dots on it, if you would. Just a blank piece of paper or whatever you got in front of you. And I'm going to give you a task in a moment. Okay, here's the task. I want you to, con once you, I want you to put your pen or pencil on the paper, on one of the dots, and connect all nine dots with four lines. But do not pick up your pen once you put it down. So connect them continuously with four lines, all nine dots, straight lines. Four straight lines, all nine dots. This is a brain teaser, this is a brain teaser. <laughs> All right, that's enough torture. <laughs> Everybody try this one first. No, that doesn't work. Okay, here it is. Right, here's one solution. Outside the box. Outside the box. We just, we mentally can't go there. We're so trained in one mindset that it's so hard to get outside the box. And this is what's so difficult for religious communities. Can you think of getting outside the box? If you can't think of it, because you're stewing in your own juices, mm -hmm. are you willing to invite some other people in to stir the pot and give you some new ideas? Are you courageous enough to let that happen? Let other people into your life and offer new possibilities? And you will poo-poo them all initially. 
The question is, can you listen and stay with that? This is, a, this is so tough for groups. So the challenge, okay, the big challenge is to change. The end of the road, or excuse me, what got you to today won't get you to tomorrow, that's for sure. A bend in the road is not an end in the road unless you fail to make this turn. And you're either going to adapt to these changes or you will die as a congregation. That's the big challenge. But the deeper invitation is really for me about this word transformation. Okay, you know you gotta change. What the heck is God inviting you into this thing for anyway? If this is a, a challenge to change, what's the deeper invitation in your lives? Well, what's the difference between change and transformation? Change is external, okay, you might change a ministry, or you might change where you live. Those are the new arrangements in your life. And that change could be an invitation to transform. Maybe you hear it, maybe you don't, maybe you ignore it, maybe, you, maybe it evokes something of you. But the transformation piece is the internal work. So you might change and live in a new local community, but you take your patterns with you. Most of the time, we will take our patterns with us to wherever we might go next in our life, or whatever new arrangements. So Paul, I know you had a heart event. Okay, here's a significant event in your life. Is that an event, just a blip on the screen and on he goes? Or does that create something in him that begins to stir internally? a new way of being. How many people, what's the percentage of people that fail diets? 90%, yeah, 90%. So only when they get to this, a new lifestyle, a new way of living, does that diet sort of stick and become effective because it's not about diet, it's about lifestyle. Or another way to look at it is the difference between incremental change and deep change. Incremental change is narrow in scope, it's reversible, extends the past. This is what most groups do chapter to chapter. Okay, They create a new way of going, but it's basically incremental steps toward whatever next movement they're taking. But the deep change is more like this. It's more intuitive, it's broader, it's irreversible, it's discontinuous. Your example, and the common example that you all have of deep change is when you joined this community. When you became a religious, you knew that something would die, and things have. You, you've changed your primary relationships in life. You changed your relationship with God. You changed your understanding and purpose in your life. Everything changed. You're still the same person wearing maybe the same kind of clothes, still associate with some of the similar people, but inside, something significant changed a whole lot of who you were and where you were going in life. So that's deep change. So while we talk about finances and buildings and all this stuff that you've got to figure out what to do with, you do. Really the question is if you're going to look at transformation, what are the patterns that need to change? The patterns of your life, how you interact with one another, the models and structures that support them, and your way of thinking that supports all that, and really the soul of who you are. So change is about all this stuff that you see on the surface. Transformation really is about this deeper stuff that's underneath all of that. So for me, this journey of transformation is this, you know, movement through the desert experience, whatever you want to call it, it is a whole lot of letting go, letting die, what needs to die in order for a new life to emerge, getting past the denial, etc., going through the muck and the mire of the wilderness, and then letting come what needs to come. So the challenge is to change the invitation is to transform and let's stand up and get some oxygen. <laughs> okay, that's part one. <laughs>